So one for anybody, uh, I assume you get a notification or see it in the corner, but if not, um, we are recording this. Uh, we do post the videos up on our YouTube channels. So uh, you're aware and by staying in the meeting, you're consenting or however that's uh, we're doing. So we'll, we'll put that, your social security and all that stuff up on YouTube. So don't worry about it. <laughs> um, so um, the uh, announcement wise, not really much to go through. Um, so uh, we have the September date stubbed out. I think we're still working on a speaker. We have a couple of backup talks and things. So uh, not in a panic, but if anybody has particular topics they want to speak about, obviously reach out to myself, John, uh, Jim. I don't, I don't think Jim's on tonight. Um, sponsors are uh, our studio, the R Consortium, and uh, Microsoft under the, uh, what was under the Revolution brand. I think it's now actually just branded Microsoft Community R. Um, the, um, uh, as John mentioned, the um, virtual cafe, just, uh, you know, bring a problem to work on, hack day Saturday type things are still going on uh, um, so often. One quick one I had via messaging, uh, gentleman named Ben Pope uh, started in our meetup in the Cleveland area for specifically around Shiny um, and uh, asked if we'd, especially with that being the topic tonight, uh, give that a mention. Um, so I'll put that link in the chat. They have a meeting coming up uh, the 1st of September as well. So um, if you're interested in tonight's topic, you may be interested in that as well. Great, yeah, feel free to throw stuff in the chat. Um, as Liz is talking or as you think of it, uh, to share with everybody. Um, but yes, I'm very excited to have Liz Nelson here with us. Um, she's uh, joining us from Chicago. Uh, I saw her present at uh, Saturday's Chicago, uh, what was that, two months ago now? Uh, what is time again. anymore, right? Um, but um, it was a great presentation about using Shiny production. So I invited her to give us a, a talk here. And so she's going to talk about using Shiny production and specifically using the, the Gollum framework, which Mubo just. Uh, much mentioned. So with that, uh, thank you, Liz, and then go ahead and uh, get started. Awesome. Can everyone hear me all right? Cool. I will share my screen. This is always the great moment where I realize exactly how many windows I have open. And so I assume you all don't want to see my Jupyter notebook that's been running for a painful amount of time. Um, Plus, it's kind of, I feel like it's a little bit of sacrilege, um, given that we're in an R meetup. Is it named untitled.ipnyb? Uh, no, it has a name now. Very good. That, that's official then. That's uh... Talking, as you know, about um, our Shiny and Golem today, I worked in Shiny for quite a while, and I'm very fond of it. Um, feel free to um, ask questions at any point. I will try to keep uh, the participants up so I can see, I think if you raise your hand. Um, otherwise, also happy to answer stuff at the end. I'm not blocking anything with my participant view, am I? <laughs> nope. Cool. All right, so first, I am also new here. I am in Chicago. Um, so right now, I'm a master's student at UChicago in computer science and public policy. Um, I am also working as a data fellow at Ballot Ready, um, which is a startup to help provide voters information to make informed choices at um, the polling place and also now to help people vote by mail. So if you're looking to do either of those things and struggling, they have some great tools and I've been really enjoying working with them this summer. Um, previously, I was at Deloitte in the public sector. Um, I worked in the analytics and cognitive practice for about four years, worked mostly with government. Um, and in the future, I have been, thanks to Shiny, very much bitten by the uh, software design bug um, and software engineering bug. And so I hope to do some more stuff in that field. Um, so very fond of R and hope to keep getting to work with R, but also really love learning all the new tool sets I'm learning in my computer science program. Um, and just random fun fact to make me more of a human and less of a floating head in the corner of your screen. Um, I have an adorable poodle mix who may crash this at any point. Um, right now he's asleep next to me. Um, and also I just learned how to ride a bike this summer. 
Um, I'm getting better at it, but still not very good at it. Um, with that, we will get going. So a question I've talked to folks a lot about in the past is like, why Shiny? Um, especially with folks who've worked with other web frameworks, they're like, well, why Shiny? Why not Ruby on Rails? Why not Django? Why not any of the many tools that exist out there? Um, and so something that I've been thinking about a lot is I also explore these other tools is Shiny can be a really great tool when it makes sense based on your developers and maintainers. Um, and that's usually one of the key lines I draw in terms of like when you should think Shiny and when you should think like Django or Flask or any of those things. Um, and so I've sort of thought through some common scenarios where Shiny is a really great tool. So I see Shiny happening a lot where someone is a data analyst and they want to make some great dashboard that they can refresh easily and it's reproducible. Maybe it's for leadership. Maybe it's just for them because they find it easier when they can see things. So that's a great use case for Shiny because you can stand it up really quickly. It makes a lot of sense if you're already working in R. And so it can be a really great tool. Similarly, I, the way I learned Shiny was I was on a data science team that sort of accidentally became web app developers where they had been doing an optimization application and then they were like, hey, so people want to use this and they don't want to have to know R. They were like, oh, well, I guess we'll put it in this application and we're already using R, so we'll do Shiny because we don't have the resources to hire a whole web dev team to make a web app. Um, and so the data science team I was on became Shiny developers and started being sort of the full stack from getting Shiny set up through the algorithms that went into the optimization and then also the UI design. And from what I've talked to, when I've talked to other people, that's been a pretty common story. Um, and then the other position sometimes I see people in and one of the scenarios Gollum is really designed to uh, address is you were the analyst from that first scenario and you presented to leadership and they were like, this is great. And now they want a ton of things in it. And so now you've been a data analyst or a data scientist and now you've sort of accidentally converted yourself into also this person who's providing this tool. Um, scenarios where I think people should actually think twice before thinking shiny as their answer is they're building some massive site and they're going to hook it to this like production database and they're hiring like a whole web dev team. That's a case where if you know you're going to have massive traffic and you have the skill sets present, shiny isn't necessarily the tool I would reach for first if that's not the skill set of your developers. Um, Another way is if, if you're in a situation where like Tableau would be sufficient, Shiny might be overkill. So maybe you just want to like drag and drop some data, you want to make a nice dashboard, you can do some really cool stuff in Tableau. I oddly struggle in it now, but it's a, also a great tool. So if it's Shiny's overkill and over customization, then you might want to think of one of the sort of off the shelf softwares. Um, or if you're on a data science team with like a fleshed out full stack engineering group, then they probably have the capabilities to do something and not have the data scientists be more specialized so that the data scientists aren't also building the web apps. Um, even in these cases, you could arguably make Shiny work. It's just that they're also, it's one of the cases where I'd say like, hey, there's other stuff too that might be able to help you. And so I wanted to share this because I actually saw this recently coming out of, I think it was the New York City R conference. Um, there was a .NET developer who gave a presentation on her experience recreating a .NET site in Shiny. Um, I am not a .NET developer, so don't ask me any specific .NET questions, but um, I thought it was really interesting because sometimes I've heard folks say like, well, how does Shiny compare in all these different ways to whatever full stack framework I'm more used to? Um, and what she found was she thought it, the stack was on par came out visually beautiful. Sometimes the UI wasn't as flexible as she wanted. Um, the place where it really struggled was like handling large numbers of concurrent users um, and deployment was better. So I think this is, and it, obviously every framework will have their own sort of set of these things and every skill set has their own sort of degree to which these things matter. But I thought this was a really interesting case study of someone actually kind of doing a controlled trial of doing our shiny development for a website versus a more traditional path. So I was super excited when this came across my Twitter feed. And so I had to share it with you all as well. 
And so I also, before I get in deeper and deeper into our shiny, um, I wanted to talk also about the life cycle because I think this also will give you some context, context for where the package golem comes in. So a lot of our shiny pa packages and apps seem to follow the life cycle of like someone's looking at a bunch of data, maybe it's you, maybe it's someone on your team, and they're saying like, hey, I really want to be able to like explore this, or I want to run different analyses and visualize it, I need a dashboard, like, wouldn't it be cool if I could do that? And then someone says like, oh, we'll build a shiny app, and they do. Um, and then they go through sort of this honeymoon period where everyone's really like excited, they're scoping new features, they're getting new ideas from users, and it's great. Um, and then they end up in sort of this maintenance and developer hell, um, where packages are changing, people are shifting in and out of the team and may not know what happened before, um, users are still excited and want more features, and I've seen teams, including my own at various times, like sort of get snowed under in this period where they're trying to maintain their previous work, but they're also getting pressed on for more and more features. Um, and I think that's really somewhere that Golem is desired to address. Um, so enter Golem. Uh, what is it? It's by their own definition, an opinionated framework for building production ready shiny applications. Whenever I hear an opinionated framework from my like originally non-CS background, my first question is, well, what opinions does it have? And in Golem's case, the things that really make it a framework and make it sort of what it is, is that they have you develop the Shiny application with the idea that every Shiny app is also a package. Um, so you What's are the developing What's your the application. Sorry, does someone have a question? We might just have a case of uneatness. Um, so they sort of have you developing as though every shiny app is also a package, which can be really helpful from a reproducibility standpoint and transferring your application later on. Um, they also believe in the Golem package that metadata and dependency management matter from the start. Um, Golem also enforces sort of file system hierarchies um, that you don't have the same restrictions on normally. Um, and it encourages testing and documentation from the start. Um, so basically what Golem does is it almost like forces the productionizing work that a lot of folks tend to do on the back end from the start and throughout the developing process. Um, so there's not, there's a bit of a bigger upswing to get moving in Golem, I think. But when you come to deployment and when it comes to maintaining the application long term, you're in a way better place. So over the course of this talk, I've sort of laid out a bunch of different portions of the Golem lifecycle. So we'll talk briefly through sort of a requirements gathering phase, um, design and wireframing, some prototyping, building, dependency management, and deployment. That's a lot, so we're not going to go over each piece in like intense depth, but I wanted to sort of give you an idea of the tool sets that are available in each of these and also give you some examples of what this looks like in Golem if you're more familiar with Shiny development as it sort of typically is carried out. So I always, I never miss a moment to talk about the importance of user interviews. Um, so I know it's not as exciting as jumping straight into code, but I think it's really important when you go to the outset of developing an application, you actually talk to users and figure out what you're supposed to be building. Um, and so the use case that I'll refer to in a few different case, like points in this show, slideshow is that I use a workout app, it's called Fitbod. Um, I generate workouts there and track them, and so, but I don't really love their interface. And so I wanted to play around with some new shiny tools. And so I was like, okay, I'll make an application where I can upload the exports I can do from the app. I want to track how much weight I've lifted over time. I want to feel accomplished. Um, and I want to track sort of how I'm doing over different exercises, maybe one rep maxes, and maybe how much I've lifted through muscle group. So this is a general idea that underlies this sort of example application. And so wireframing. Um, wireframing can really help you figure out what you're building before you go to do that. 
Um, and especially in Shiny in some ways, because UI elements are pretty easy to create, I think it actually makes wireframing even more important because it's very tempting to just like plunge your hands in and start building things. Um, and sometimes you can get yourself in a bit of a bind if you don't sort of think through what you're building first. Um, and so I, there's a lot of cool fancy wireframing tools out there. Mockups is great. Um, Envision is fancy. I kind of prefer to just sit down and draw. Um, so I took a stab at drawing what I wanted this application to look like. And so here I'm sort of like, oh, I think I want a modal box. I want some sort of pop up to make people upload data. I want some sort of flexible thing to tell people how much they've lifted and I want some graphs. Got to have a good interactive graph and a shiny app it's almost required. I think they'd take away my shiny dev card if I didn't have a plotly app at some point in here. Um, and so you can go through here. I kept wireframing and drawing things out. I was like, okay, I want three tabs. I want sort of these different graphs and charts. Um, and if I was doing this for production, at this point, I'd also sit down with the user and say like, all right, does this look like what you want? Like, does this make sense? Do we want to make any modifications? And this would help both them and I know what I'm building before I start building it. So on that note, can actually get building. Um, before I go into that, any questions so far? Feel free to just unmute yourself and ask if you do. While I grab a drink of water. What types of uh, development problems motivated the de uh, the creation of Gollum? So it was actually really interesting because the book that. Um, I now like really love in terms of learning about production shiny, which is called engineering shiny by Thinkar. I think I have a link at the end. Um, was being written as my team was going through a lot of these same struggles. And I think what happened to a lot of teams is they built these applications sort of like very free form and like got excited. They added features. So for example, I was on a team. We had this really cool optimization app. Um, but originally people were just sort of, you know, building it and they didn't lock down package dependencies because, you know, they were just having fun with it and it was in progress. Um, but then over time, right, packages change, your server gets upgraded and things started to break. Um, and that was really when we started needing to look into a lot of the things that Golem tries to address. So things like we needed to manage our package dependencies better. We needed to lock down our versioning better. Um, our, files, our file structures were a mess because people had sort of just made things as they tested them out. Um, and our deployment process was needed a lot of help. Um, and so I think Golem was really sort of came about as a function of the maturation of Shiny as a tool. I think Shiny started getting used for way more than it was originally intended for and did an amazing job. And so people kept building applications. And so people started looking for tools to sort of build a bridge between more traditional R for analysts and data science and like typical software engineering tools. And I think that's where Gollum sort of sits is this bridge between like standard R development and like more standard production software engineering. Um, and it sort of tries to bring the best of both together. Thanks. No problem. Any more questions before we move on? All right then, let's get building. Um, so you install Golem like any other package, um, but then you can either use the menu in our studio or you can use a command line uh, Golem function to create a Golem project. And so that basically sets up this web of files, um, which was a little startling to me the first time I used it because I was used to developing shiny apps from scratch and all of a sudden someone had set up this infrastructure for me. Um, but if you've done any package development, it should look pretty familiar. Because Golem is created to help you design in a package format, it sort of sets up that framework for you from the start. Um, so there's a place for metadata about the package that Golem adds. It has its own functions that live in the dev folder. Um, the standard stuff Shiny needs is in this other inst folder. Um, 
There's also a man folder that I think Golem fills out as well as the namespace. And then most of your scripts go in the R folder when you're actually creating your application. And so to set up the application, the first thing you do is they actually have sort of like a three script sequence. Um, and so if you go into the dev folder, you can start from the beginning. Um, Golem asks you to fill out sort of some basic information about your application. So a name, title, description, your name, um, your email and a repo URL. Um, and so this is sort of where you set up your description just to get going. And then there are lots of options, which is a bit of a theme in Golem. Um, so you can set a license, you can set if you want to read me or markdown, you can set if you want to attach a data set that's used inside your application. And then you can tell Golem if you want it to set up the recommended testing infrastructure and the recommended dependency infrastructure. So if you uh, say you use recommended tests, it sets up a test that structure, um, which is typically used for package development. Um, and if you say you want the recommended dependencies, it'll install some like standard packages in your dependencies. Um, I used all the presets because they made sense to me and were generally what I wanted for this application. But if you had strong feelings about any of these, you can toggle them. And there's much more in the application in the dev 01. Um, it's basically a place where you can switch things on and off to start. And then we get into prototyping. Um, and prototyping is something I hadn't done with my previous team where I used a lot of our shiny and desperately wish I would have because it would have saved us a lot of angst. Um, part of the Golem sort of universe um, that especially the Think Our team has made is this package called Shiny Ipsum, um, which is basically made to let you prototype out a shiny interface without needing to like load your data and get all of your algorithms or formulas working. You can just make graphs and it'll give some like dummy data behind it to generate something. Um, and so this is also a good time to illustrate some of the Golem sort of tool set. So you add a package to your Golem project by using the command use this use package. Um, you can add modules using the add module command. So this was new for me. I was used to setting up my own module scripts. Golem, you can actually add it with a function and then it will set up your server and UI functions for you. Um, and then you can just build them in from there. Um, when designing a UI, I also love some of the standard, beautiful, shiny UI packages. So shiny dashboard and shiny dashboard plus are both excellent packages to give your UI some beautiful structure from the start. Um, there's many others as well, but those two are very, very popular, especially for dashboarding. Um, and to use Shiny Ipsum for some example functions are things like random ggplot or random dt. Um, and these create those example graphics I mentioned. So just a table with data that's underlying from the Shiny Ipsum package. And so actually an example of this is here. So this is an example app of what we talked about before, um, where I've just basically thrown um, these shiny Ipsum graphics inside a uh, shiny dashboard plus application. So I set up like some basic uh, select eyes drop downs, I set up a shiny dashboard plus uh, sidebar. Um, but then this max weight over time, is just dummy data from shiny ipsum using the uh, random ggplot. And the same with the top exercises. You'll see that the things in the DT are not exercises because it's just random underlying data. But this is somewhere where I would then potentially take it to a user and say like, hey, does this look like something that's helpful? And this is nice because at this point, Normally without this package, I would spend a lot of time like building out these graphs and making sure like I could get something in there, I'd have to load in the data and here I just was like, ah, I want a random table. It needs to be around this many columns and Shiny Ipsum will just make it for me. 
Any questions on the prototyping here? Oh, I should note before four questions. Um, because your app is now packaged, this took me by surprise when I first used Golem. You now run it differently than a normal Shiny app. So don't panic if you don't see the run app button. Um, you instead run the script dev run dev, which runs a development versus a production version of your application. And so if you run that script, then you'll see your Shiny application pop up like it normally would. Any questions on prototyping? So can, uh, can you have a theme here? Can you define, you know, the, the colors and themes? I know you've uh, used some standard uh, navigation capability, but how customizable is it? Uh, I mean, the CSS and stuff, I mean, how do you control all that? Yeah, so you can input your own custom CSS um, in a Shiny application. Um, there's also different packages for dashboarding and other things that include their own sort of library of components to give applications a different look and feel. Um, so for example, I think there's a semantic framework that's been put into a package for Shiny. There's I think Bulma IO also has one that they've ported over. Um, so people are like porting over standard uh, web sort of look and feel frameworks into Shiny. Um, but you can also define your own in the CSS. So for example, my former team used the like standard Twitter bootstrap theme. Um, but yeah, you can change all of the colors. I tend to leave, I've, I've seemingly worked for a lot of agencies and companies that have used blue as their color. And so now almost unconsciously, I end up with blue. Um, but you can change that sort of thing. Any other questions? I mean, can, can you do things like, you know, logging in, you know, uh, personalization based on your roles and stuff, uh, you know, in, in Shiny like this? Yeah, so that's more recent in Shiny. There's been a lot more thought and sort of flushing out of authentication. Um, so I believe there are some new authentication packages for Shiny. When I worked in a Shiny app, we had authentication controlled through a, like, login where we stored um, some like usernames and uh, hash passwords in a database and then checked against those. It was an internal application, so we didn't need anything insane. Um, but there's increasingly also like authentication packages built out for Shiny. I don't remember off the top of my head the names of the ones that are most popular right now. Um, I think also if you subscribe, I think RStudio also, if you use their like RStudio Connect service has their own authentication protocols they give you. Um, so it's an area where Shiny is maybe less strong than a lot of traditional web frameworks, but it's also an area where it's been developing pretty fast to try to catch up because of Tiny. Look at uh, polis.net. Sorry? Polis.net. Mm. Oh, I'm sorry, polis.tech. Polis.tech, cool. Yeah. Thanks. Any more questions on this front before we move on? All right then. So just another quick looks, look in the Golem toolbox. You can add um, helper functions and add utility functions to these two different Golem functions, which what those essentially do is create like a nice little file system um, for you to have like your small functions and your larger functions stored. You can do that outside of modules, you can do it within modules. Um, so it's pretty flexible. Um, and then yeah, again, you continue to add packages with use this and add modules um, with add module. Um, so Golem's basically made to sort of provide a forcing function for good sort of file hierarchy um, practices when you use their functions to set various parts up. So for me as like a Shiny developer, that took a little bit of getting used to, but then I did kind of appreciate it because it made me actually follow my own best practices. One of the cool places where Golem also allows some additional functionality and really encourages you to be proactive is testing. Um, and anyone who's heard me 
talk about Shiny knows that I am a super big proponent of testing, having been the developer on the other side of many a panicked phone call. Catching things before they are urgent is always a plus. Um, so test that can be integrated from the start. Golem lets you call it and set it up from the very beginning um, to do unit testing for non-reactive UI functions. So basically, say like you have a pounds to kilograms function like we talked about in this application, um, you could test that with test that. Um, or any other functions that don't need user input to be um, calculated and checked. So it's great to flesh out your testing framework as you go. Um, for load times, uh, there's additional sort of utilities with Shiny load test. Um, and so this is really helpful for understanding how your application performance changes as increasing number of users run sessions. And so Shiny load test basically automates a process of letting you record what a user session looks like, click around, do some stuff, and then basically use a command line tool under the hood to then like simulate increasing numbers of people doing what you've sort of described as a typical use pattern. Um, and then it actually has a really beautiful dashboard and web framework that pops up in the next bit that I'll show you that lets you then view the results of this sort of testing against your Shiny app. Um, there's also some great packages for testing UI and reactivity that Shiny provides some good uh, interface to. So some of these are newer to me. There's a lot more interfaces for JavaScript based um, testing coming out. So Curry provides an R interface for JavaScript Chrome based puppeteer functionality as well as something called Gremlins. Um, and so you can use it in sort of bookmark applets and JavaScript if you prefer that, but um, Curry basically provides that functionality in a package form if you prefer that. Um, so that basically lets you record different tests um, and Gremlins um, you can access via Curry or via gremlin.js, which you can make a bookmark li bookmarklet of. Um, and that I'm particularly fond of because it basically can test what happens with a very chaotic user. Um, so testing the idea that anything, your user may use your application in a way that right now you cannot possibly imagine. Um, and Gremlin is based, is supposed to allow you to basically do a controlled test of what happens when sort of utter chaos is unleashed upon your user interface. And you can do that through a bookmarklet. Um, so you can do it really on any web page and just see what happens and you can do it on your own app. Um, and then Shiny Test is a Shiny package to allow you to record different tests and take snapshots of your application state at different points and then use that to build tests so that you can see if any different kinds of inputs and activity create unexpected UI results. So actually, here are some images of what these things look like, because I always find that helps me conceptualize it. So shiny load test um, will show you things like the slowest max time, slowest min time, and show you various other statistics about your overall um, loading time with different amounts of users. Um, Gremlin.js is very fun to test out because you see all of these chaotic little red dots moving around the user interface as they mess with your um, UI. And the Curry interface, if you choose to use that to access Gremlin, um, will actually has some special arguments to let you manipulate particular parts um, of your Shiny interface and sort of say, like, I want a certain number of these Gremlins to, like, mess with my slider or checkboxes and so on and so forth. Any questions about testing? This is an area where Shiny's been really changing fast. All right then. Bonus, something that's not like straight up shiny, but I always think is a good thing to plug is accessibility testing. 
this is something that frequently gets a bit lost in Shiny development, but I think is actually pretty important as Shiny becomes used for more and more things that are critical for the public accessing data and like government applications or used for different people to make decisions in an organization, um, are accessibility testing toolboxes. So accessibility insights for web is a really great both bookmarklet and a separate page that lets you go through comprehensive testing of a web application um, for different accessibility issues. So things like tab stops, can you navigate the web page using only a keyboard, which is important for a lot of screen readers. Um, is your color contrast good for folks that have vision deficiencies? Um, is your website accessible for people who are colorblind in different ways? Um, and does it make sense if you're accessing it with a screen reader based on how it will read and how it will access the different headings? So Accessibility Insights for Web will take you through all of those different pieces. Um, and there's also a bookmarklet that will let you use a lot of really standard accessibility testing just as you're looking at your web app. There's also a tool called Totally, which is actually made by um, Khan Academy. Um, and that will let you do HTML based testing with the visual elements highlighted. So it's really helpful to look at what in your UI may be causing the problem. They also have a really cool um, beta testing screen reader view that lets you mouse over different elements and experience them as someone using a screen reader would. There's a lot of other tools here as well. Accessibility Insights and Totally are my two favorites out of this bunch, and there's a ton more accessibility tools, but these are just some that I've used in the past and have found useful. I'll show you a quick example of what these can actually look like. So this is that application I mentioned before on a different page. I went through and I ran um, Totally against it, and so it told me that I have for example, it'll annotate down here um, to the right corner. And it will also, you can click through different kinds of annotation in your sort of glasses view. Um, and so this is showing me that my header level threes are all good here, but I have a header two, I think, before a header one. Um, and so it's flagging that as something that might be confusing to a screen reader when it navigates hierarchically. Similarly, this is an example of what testing may look like with Accessibility Insights for Web. Um, so here, for example, I tested the tab stops. So that's what you see here with the numbers connecting each other with lines. That's testing how someone navigating with their keyboard using tab would experience the page. And so you can see that this would actually have a problem because over here where you can see the um, like exercises and the number of times it's been done, this teal headed box, it skips the whole table in the middle. So that's not great because someone navigating through tabs would never get to see those things in that table. Um, so that's somewhere where I might look and investigate um, if I saw this result on accessibility insights. Similarly, you can see in this pop up here, I've had it highlight places where the background contrast doesn't meet um, accessibility standards. Um, and so this is telling me that my I have an insufficient foreground color with my background color in this particular shade of blue. Um, so that's another place where I would maybe investigate like increasing the text size or um, changing to a darker blue so the contrast is greater. Um, so that's just a plug that I think a lot of people who may do some web dev, I sometimes forget that you can use those tools in Shiny, um, but you can use Shiny renders in the end in HTML, so you can use any tools that people would use on HTML also on your Shiny interfaces. Um, and that can be really helpful to sort of do accessibility audits as you develop. Any questions on that? Some of these things you're mentioning might be difficult to remediate in Shiny. You don't really have fine-grained control over things like the tab order and so on. That is true. Um, so that's one of the disadvantages of Shiny right now is I think it's not always the best from an accessibility point of view. Um, I've been seeing some tickets actually in the um, 
shiny like overall package to try to remedy that. Um, but sometimes you can insert like some custom JavaScript or other things or investigate different table formatting. Um, so I think it's a case where it's something that you should think about if you're making a web app that's going to be critical to how people access information and sort of know your audience. Um, so for example, I made a web app that was used by a relatively small group of users, but it was important to them. Um, and none of them were, yeah. would have been particularly concerned about the tab stops, but I realized later on when we were having a new person vet our data, um, he was colorblind. And so for him, the most important thing was just having a palette for the graphs that was colorblind friendly. Um, so depending on your audience, that might be what you need. You might just need to be careful of your color contrast or make your text a little bit bigger and have a colorblind friendly palette. Um, if you're like providing a critical service, it might be more important to think through like, okay, how can I potentially remediate issues that could be caused um, by having this sort of like, having this particular form of UI. Um, so even though I think it's not something that's actually addressed perfectly well in Shiny yet, I think it's a good thing to be aware of as we think about like, what does the future of Shiny look like and what does it look like as this tool set's built out even further. Any other questions on this front? All right then. Dependency management, everyone's favorite thing, or at least potentially my favorite thing after battling it a lot. Um, so there's a few different options here um, that can be used in concert or separately. So RNV is a newish package that's made to basically try to make virtual environments for R, as far as I can sort of tell. Um, so it's a more common practice in Python world to be working in virtual environments. Um, but RNV, if you use Packrat at any point, RNV is basically the sequel to Packrat, a way to sort of snapshot your project-based library of packages um, and sort of hold your versions of those so that then you can um, have your team all working in the same kinds of environments and also rewind. So say Dplyr pushes an update and then all of your uh, data munging and all maybe some of your inside application algorithms are now all broken. With RNV, you can actually revert to a previous environment state where you had a previous version of Dplyr. Um, so it's made to sort of help you guard against those packages changing over time and make sure your team's all on the same page with what versions of packages you're developing on. Um, and it can be saved on the project level. Docker is something where I think there's been a lot of increased enthusiasm about Docker and the R community. Docker is a virtualized environment for your entire system. Um, so my team actually Dockerized our applications after the fact because we had a package that actually relied on a very particular version of Linux. And one of our servers was going to be changing versions. And so we Dockerized our application so that we could basically set the entire application up in a container with the operating system, operating system dependencies that are necessary to set up packages, the R version, the R packages, and all the R package dependencies are basically stored in a nice tidy little bundle in Docker to be unpacked at will. Um, and this is even easier now than it was before because there's a lot of work that's gone into some different R packages to make creating Docker files really easy. So if you're really confident in your sort of command line fluency and want to look at creating a Docker file from scratch from something like, I would recommend going straight from scratch unless you actually have to. The Rocker project maintains a lot of Docker files that are like ready for you to set up our studio or R. Um, but if you're like really, you don't want to delve into this, all you want to do is like get it set up. Um, Golem has an add Docker file command that will go through and make you a Docker file. Um, it uses the Rocker project Docker images um, and you can also actually develop in a Docker container. Um, so if you wanted to go for the ultimate in shiny development reproducibility, you and your team could develop in a Docker container 
and then you could have that same environment that you then deploy for your production application. Um, and Golem sort of has tried to make that a little simpler than it would be otherwise. Actually, before I go into deployment, any questions on dependency management? Are there any differences in how you would use these um, different from a package in particular that you found in practice? How do you use Docker different from a package or? Yeah. Yeah, so Docker is a little different because it does work also on the operating system level. So it's, it'll try. Right. I meant like deploying like a utils package on, on Docker or something like that versus uh, a Shiny app. Yeah, so when you deploy with Docker, you deploy your Shiny app within it. So it's basically snapshotting all of that. It is a little weird in terms of like you have to set up the container and you have to like run Docker, which can be a little bit of a startup cost for some folks because that's not norm as normal within a traditional R skill set. Um, so I would say like getting Docker, like going through sort of the Docker learning process, there's a lot of like great tutorials about it, but like it was something that I know I had to do a little bit more work up front figuring it out. Um, I would also say like if you're just working on a single app and it's more of a short term thing, Docker is potentially a little bit of overkill if it's a, if it's like a significant upstart cost for you. If you're like, oh, I can totally do that. That's fast. Then it's a great way to develop. If you're like, that's gonna take me a little bit going through some tutorials and I am uncertain. Um, then if you're like working on an application, you expect to be in it regularly, RN might be a better solution for you that requires less upfront effort. Um, I think it's a great tool, but it's also like, it's a bit more work depending on sort of where you tend to spend your time. If you're more of like on the analyst side or if you're more like comfortable on the infrastructure side. Does that make sense? Or does that answer your question? Yeah, that's it's helpful to hear. I think my, I should have worded my question better. Um, having used RM for packages before, is there something different, particularly, I guess, RM uh, in using it for the Shiny app than for packages? Ah, uh, I don't think it works particularly differently. It still creates the same file structure. Okay. Um, I haven't used it that much personally. I was in a my team tried to use Packrat previously and that went very poorly. Um, yeah. yeah, it was, I think I saw it even in the introduction for when RN was coming out, they were like, we made Packrat and that was a mistake. So we're trying to correct our mistake. Um, my sense is Docker is a little bit of a more robust way to store your packages because at least in my team's sake, we actually like hard up the package and then ported that over to the server. So it was like truly everything in a bundle. Um, that particular team didn't have access to the internet either. So literally everything had to be brought through very carefully through a firewall and go through all of this craziness. Um, so in that case, like Docker is a good option if you like don't have access to a lot of other stuff. It's still really irritating to get, it's more irritating than usual to get set up in that case because anything is irritating when you don't have access to the internet. Um, but my understanding is RM works pretty okay within the Golem package. Um, it's not as well integrated though as some other tool sets. They're a little bit more well set up to make Docker files than they are to like do some of the RM stuff from what I can see. Thank you. So uh, I guess the, this is interesting that you mentioned Docker. Now, um, the Docker in production is the same as the Docker you use for development, or it, can there be further slimmed down in production uh, to make the size a little lo lower when you actually deploy it versus when you are actually developing on it? Yeah, you could slim it down, especially if you, for instance, if you wanted more packages to do some of your like data munging, but you didn't actually need them to run the Shiny app you could conceivably like slim down your Docker file so that when it actually, when you ran your production file, it would only have like the absolute necessary packages and information to run the Shiny app, as opposed to like, say your team had like a set of packages you use day to day, but not all of them were in the Shiny app. You could have a different Docker setup potentially for your development environment. 
Uh -huh. um, so it would probably depend on sort of like what your use case was and what sort of like overall infrastructure you had to play with. Mm -hmm. But I would say Docker is one of those places where the R community has like moved pretty fast and there's some really cool resources that are coming out to make it easier for people in R because I think a lot of people um, didn't in, like had issues where they had made shiny apps, including my team, where they made shiny apps that then were, they were really struggling with long-term deployment because of really wonky dependency management. Mm -hmm. Cool. Oh, also actually a point there that I almost forgot. It's also really great if you want to test your application with multiple versions of R or multiple versions of anything because you can just make a new container, spin it up, test it, and then tear it down. Um, so I've heard people recently talking a lot about Docker for package development um, because package development for CRAN, I think, tends to have some pretty intense restrictions on multi-R version functionality. So if that's something you're interested in, that also makes a bigger use case for Docker in terms of just all the different contingencies you need to test for. Mm -hmm. Any additional questions on dependency before we go to deployment? Um, do, does this require uh, any uh, binary source control? Does it work with, uh, you know, the binary source control, uh, um, you know, uh, binary artifact managers? Uh, you know, the, the depend when you mentioned dependency, you know, things like artifactory, you know, where, where do you keep your dependencies, you know, when you, I guess this is not a compiled language, right? So. Yeah, so Docker, the only place I've run into sort of things where I needed that before is when we were setting up our Docker container, we sort of realized that we needed various um, like OS based packages to like set up different R packages that had dependencies yep. within the OS. Um, mm -hmm. And so that was, we had to make sure we had all of those in place. And so since my team actually had to build our own Docker file kind of from the ground up, mm -hmm. um, that was a problem for us. But if you're, if you're able to use something from like the Rocker project, um, and you like can pull that down and then build off that, that should take care of like most common issues you would run into and in encapsulating in a container. Okay, got it, thank you. And the Rocker project is great. Like they keep really up-to-date containers, like their stuff's awesome. Mm -hmm. Anything else on this front? All right, deployment everyone's favorite nerve wracking time. Um, so Gollum tries to make deployment sort of as easy as it can be, but I think anyone who's had to deal with production deployment knows that things can get rocky at various times when you're deploying, especially the first time. Um, so if you're not using Docker, Gollum provides an interface to add um, our Studio Connect files, to add Shiny Apps IO files, or Shiny Server files that will prepare your application to go up on any of those hosting platforms. Um, when you're, if you're using Docker, you can also add Docker files that are specific to hosting on Heroku or Shiny Proxy. Um, and so they've flushed those out to like provide the interfaces that are necessary for those platforms. Um, so I think probably the deployment with Golem will evolve over time because as people are deploying uh, at Shiny Apps in more and more ways, it becomes more helpful. Um, I don't think there's any particular uh, setup they have right now for deployment on something like AWS or Google Cloud, um, but I could potentially see that being something that happens in the future. Um, and so in those cases, you'd probably want sort of the vanilla Docker file, um, but we'll see, that might be forthcoming. Um, another interesting thing that I think comes from Golem being a package is um, you can actually share it as a package. So you can build it and create a tar file, and then you can actually like, give that tar file to someone, have them unzip it, and then install it remote, um, like as a package like they normally would. And once they've installed it, 
um, then they can just run your Shiny app like you did, um, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so if you've designed it as a package, all as Golem would want you to, and it passes in all those ways, then people can build it just like they would a package that you built and maybe isn't on CRAN yet. Though you could try to get it on CRAN as well. Um, so I think that's also an interesting way to think about how you can share a Shiny app that I wouldn't have necessarily thought about, but is uniquely facilitated by the way Golem makes you build your app. Questions here? All righty. So, uh, I, I guess one, one little question. Can you connect from our studio to a running Docker container to do your coding there? Yeah, so I had a prior team that actually did set up. We hadn't, like, but by the time I left, we hadn't been using it extensively, but we set up our studio running in a Docker container. Um, so it was, it was as if it was running on a server, mm -hmm. and then we accessed it through like a web browser. Mm -hmm. and logged into our studio that way. Um, I think there are Rocker containers that they maintain that have active R Studio installation, so you can do that. Okay. Um, so you can make like an R Studio session in a Docker container and develop that way. Okay, very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, it's a pretty fascinating way to do development and deployment. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think it's going to be more and more I think people are going to flesh it out and it's going to be more and more common as people potentially have larger teams working on this sort of application and need to do a lot of package control. Mm -hmm. I, um, we have a Shiny app on our Studio Connect running on a Docker container. Um, and actually through that is how we do the authentication. So oh, okay, cool. I had heard about Shiny Connect having like, or was it our Studio Connect? It's our Studio Connect, but it still hosts the Shiny apps, yeah. To okay, deploy cool. your shiny apps. I had heard about them like rolling out some cool authentication stuff. I'm very envious you get to use it because we're not allowed <laughs> in my previous team. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really um, so we work a lot with PHI uh, like health data, and it's been really helpful for that purpose. That's really awesome. <laughs> that was actually the end of my like prepared content. Um, so also, I highly recommend this Engineering Shiny book. That's somewhere where I look for a lot of resources. It's under development right now, but I think they're publishing at some point soon. Um, you're also welcome to hit me up on Twitter or LinkedIn um, and ask Shiny related questions, but otherwise like happy to discuss any and all of these topics um, with whatever remaining time we have. I don't know what you're, I am also new to this meetup. So I don't know what the normal time span is for questions and such. So I yield that to John. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Liz. Um, I mean, it's fairly flexible. I figure as long as people are interested, I, I wouldn't want to go more than 20 minutes from now. Um, so I think we have plenty of time for questions. Um, so, um, so yeah, I have some questions, but I want to let people who've been waiting quietly, uh, if they want to have a chance, so feel free to jump in. Uh, you can either throw them in the chat here, um, or unmute yourself, uh, feel free to ask. Thanks for a great presentation, Liz. I, I was wondering, how, how are you uh, planning to apply computer science to policy? Yeah, so I'm really interested in sort of application development for public services and public administra administration of services. My summer work is actually a good example of what I've been really hoping to get my hands on in terms of like facilitating civic participation through technology and informed voting. Um, but I'm just really interested in like how, how we can use different kinds of applications and software development to really make accessing government and local services easier um, and make it more accessible for people in a variety of situations. Um, I joke sometimes that a lot of the folks in my program all came to learn computer science and policy and apply computer science to policy and a lot of what we end up talking about is actually times when that's not a good idea. Um, so I also, uh, I don't know if it's a great role I've started playing, but I'm also a uh, frequent person who says like, well, wait a minute, 
maybe this isn't a thing we should automate. Um, and that's sort of the other role I find myself playing. So I'm both an advocate for the use of public, for the use of computer science and public policy and in applications to make services better and to help people access the help and different um, government functions they need. But I am also a uh, very staunch proponent of sort of thinking about the ethics implications of that as well. Thanks, that's uh, quite balanced and ours is a fairly advanced choice for that, that type of thing. Yeah, I found it, I really like R. It was my sort of entry point into the computer science world. Um, and so it's been interesting as I've picked up other languages and done other work to find like there, there's still some things, there are things that I love doing in R, there are things I love in other languages now. And it's, it's fascinating to me sometimes how uh, working, for example, in Python for a little bit, I reach back and get to create new columns and not have to deal with pandas indexing. And I'm just like, oh, this is so nice. Um, and then there's other things I'm fond of in Python and JavaScript stresses me out though. Um. Thanks. So have you ever considered using, uh, you know, R or shiny applications inside, you know, uh, an, uh, a Docker orchestration engine like uh, Kubernetes or, uh, uh, you know, OpenShift or something like that? I mean, uh, any, any uh, experiences with that? So I haven't done that in the past. I've heard people talk about it. Um, I think, I think a lot of the time at the point where people are thinking that in depth about scale and infrastructure, a lot of the times, honestly, they have the skill sets on their teams where they haven't reached for shiny to do their sort of web app development to begin with. I think there's more people who are trying to do that um, because of like some of the cool capabilities shiny has, but I personally haven't done it in the past. Um, alas, my dog is coming to say hi right now. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> alas, we didn't have access to um, a lot of like orchestration software or Docker Compose in my previous work. But I can see how it'd be interesting, especially, or helpful, especially if you were working with like a production database as well and you wanted to connect all of that and have potentially a separate container. Um, so I think there's potentially a future there. So you mentioned the load test. Is there common patterns that you found that make for slow, shiny apps that are best avoided? I think in general, it's just high interactivity. Like the more interactive it is, the harder it gets to load because shiny is, like you can use shiny promises to try to get a little bit asynchronous, but it still just kind of struggles. Um, I think some issues I think one of the things when you're having issues with loading applications and concurrent users is to like first like reevaluate what actually needs to be reactive. Sometimes we go kind of overboard with reactivity because I think we get so excited. We're like, I can make it change. And then all of a sudden your graph is reactive to like seven things and you're just in this like terrible reactivity web, which is A, debugging hell and B, not great for load times. Um, the other thing that can be weird is if you're accessing a database to do reading and writing in Shiny and you have concurrent users, sometimes they can like kind of mess each other up a little bit. Um, especially if you have different parts of your application that are like reactive to one user saving and then another user wants to load that. That can get kind of gnarly, not only necessarily in loading, but also in terms of just making sure that people's sessions are aligned. Um, so like session management in Shiny can also get a little weird if you have users trying to see things each other are doing quickly. Um, so I think those are some places where things can get really muddled. Um, and users just like saving things in weird ways can happen at various points too. But I think in general, it's like the more reactivity, just like the, the higher the load. Um, and if you have like really big data sets, that can also like start slowing you down if someone's run something. Like we were running a really large optimization and that can really get gnarly. Great, great advice. So yeah, limit essential interactivity. 
Yeah, interactivity, both beautiful, double-edged sword. Um, can you see the, can you see the chat, Liz? Yes, I can now. They just asked a question. Is yes, retrofitting. Price for retrofitting apps for this framework. Yeah, so it, it depends on the size of your application. I actually did a little bit of that when I've been experimenting with Golem. I didn't really want to build something entirely from scratch to get to play with it. So I was porting over something I built in my normal sort of organic way. Um, I think it can be a little irritating if you create the modules from like the module script, if you have a ton of them. If you have a few, like Golem just like sticks the functions in places and you can just copy paste. Um, I think that the setup can be a little irritating, but if you want to make your app a package anyway, honestly, it's probably easier than going through all of the struggle to retrofit into like an app style directory yourself. Um, depending on, it's sort of, yeah, it's sort of like a trade off, right? Like depending on how much of Golem's functionality you've already like independently evolved to do what you need to do, like it may be less helpful. But if you're looking at all the different pieces that Golem provides and being like, oh, like, oh, I really want to add a Docker file and do that. And like, oh, wait, I really wish I had a better file hierarchy for adding different functions at different points. And I really want to, this to be a package. Like if a lot of native Golem functionality is stuff that you haven't made yet for yourself and want, then it's probably more worth it to like port over piece by piece, even if that can be a little tedious. I brute forced it a little bit myself and copy pasted chunks. Not too ashamed to admit it. <laughs> Have a request for an Elton cameo. He's uh, eating his antler right now. So I think he'll get cranky if I pick him up, but he may jump on me at some point. I think he's trying to learn to code because he likes to look over my shoulder a lot. Um, but so far, uh, based on his keyboard stomping, he's not there yet. He did almost shut down one of my long running scripts earlier and I was very nervous. I need like a shield over like control C or something so he doesn't do anything. I don't want him to. <laughs> Uh, just a generic uh, shiny question, you know, while uh, while we're waiting for others to think of, have you have you ever been able to create a shiny app for uh, creating, uh, uh, you know, the heat maps, for example? Because I've had a lot of troubles creating heat maps uh, in in shiny. Uh, I mean, it's uh, it is not really very uh, in R in general, uh, not not just shiny. And I'm trying to figure out how to make it uh, more interactive. Uh, hmm. And I resorted to using Excel to generate, uh, you know, heat map data. Is that uh, easy to do in R and Shiny in general? So I I haven't done a lot of geospatial stuff in R as much. Um, I know there is like a fair amount of mapping functionality. I don't know if Plotly supports interactive mapping. I always look to Plotly whenever I'm looking for like interactivity. Um, Mm -hmm. So I like the Plotly package in general is great. They cross over into Python as well. In Python, I've always used GeoPandas um, for a static sort of heat map sort of look. Um, I think I think some of the R spatial people would probably be better suited. I know Angela Lee's done a bunch of that. Um, and runs like pretty active like spatial R chats on Twitter that are always cool to see. Um, so that's a good resource for that, but I haven't personally built anything like that in Shiny. Um, but there are some like, I, I would suspect there are resources, I just haven't personally used them. Okay, thank you. Okay. Check, check out Shiny Showcase. Yeah, Shiny Showcase is a great resource too, that's a good point. Okay, thank you. Mm. Have a plus one for leaflet and leaflet extras. That's a yeah. That's a good point. I haven't used that very much, but I've I've seen it around a few times.
if you hear thumping behind me, my dog is finally, I think he's turning over his food bowl in protest of like lack of treats. Okay, there's a hungry dog, people. So last minute question, last chance before the dog gets fed. He's already had dinner. He's just cranky. He just always wants more food. He needs food and attention. Yeah, oh my God, he's needy. He's lucky he's very fluffy because he crashes half of my calls. <laughs> just like, I need love. Everyone look at me. And I'm like, bud. Um, all right. So let's end it here. Um, thank you very much, uh, Liz, for presenting. Um, this was great. Um, very informative. Um, and there's a lot of interest in, uh, in shiny development, so this was great. Um, I, all the people who uh, on the call, remember, we're always looking for speakers. This could be you. Um, and if you don't feel up for doing a full, you know, the whole thing just for you, feel free to say, hey, I'd like to just have a 20 minute presentation slot and we'll try and find two, a person to join you, right? So don't feel like you have to do the whole thing. If you want to just dip your toes in presenting, feel free to pitch a 20 minute talk. Um, but um, yeah, that's something we're always looking for. So feel free to, to reach out to me or one of the other co-organizers um, with your ideas.